Okay. All right. So, what if what if this was your final exam? How would you do? It would be yours too, Mister. So don't you even think you're out of this. No, so did you get an answer sheet? Yeah, you made me answer it. All right. All right. The instrument cluster illumination circuit is tricky. Typically, what kind of circuit is it? Parallel, series, series parallel, or Darlington? <coughs> There are some fill in the blank questions here too. I know y'all like those. Oh, but. We gotta saturate you with this stuff. That's how they teach you in the military. They saturate you with it until you're both green in it. <laughs> Pretty much. Technician A says, if the tail lamp fuse blows, the instrument lamp will go dark on some vehicles. Technician B says, a positive side of a non-energized illumination lamp circuit will show a ground if checked with a test light. So you get your test light and you hook it in the hot here and you're touching it there. So what do you think? Listen to me, I'm in class right now, let me call you back. What's she doing? <coughs> Next question. Technician A says vacuum fluorescent displays and liquid crystal displays work the same way. Technician B says all digital speedometers are sensor driven rather than cable driven and all analog needle speedometers are cable driven. To determine the full extent of the role a particular electronic component plays in a particular vehicle system, the best place to start is where? Owner's manual table of contents or index, description and operation page of the system in question, the wiring schematic pages, or the TSB index. You need to sit closer and see you squint and get your glasses. Alright. You notice that Sierra never squints at anything, so she's always got little glasses on there, right? Alright. Then it's an A says the instrument lamps on this vehicle are fed through a rheostat on the headlight switch. Then it's an B says these lamps won't work unless the trip reset button is pressed. Who's correct? This is on a 2003 Wrangler, by the way. schematics that do some of them. Technician A says one good way to check this BMW brake light switch is to bypass it and see if the circuit works. Technician B says checking a load carrying switch with an ohm meter is not always a reliable test. With the key off, if you apply the brakes on this vehicle, what will happen? A, nothing. B, the brake light will flash. T, the C, the 10 amp fuse will blow. D, the relay will energize and illuminate the brake light. Look carefully at the schematic. Read the words. Everybody got it? Have you already made your answer? Question 8. This meter is set to read what? Are 
answered me, Brad? Yes, sir. Okay. Question nine. What's the difference between a rheostat and a potentiometer? I know that one. But I can't, you know what? The answer is retarded. <laughs> That's a fill in the blank. Uh, yeah. Look, I got it right here. Hold on. Where'd you learn that? Like two? Or what? Uh huh. When I on uh, Google. <laughs> There's nothing long wrong with Googling as long as you get a good answer, or as long as you get the answer. As long as you get the answer, as long as you get the answer, I agree with. Everybody got that? You did it one more time. I'm going to plug in my power cord. The seat belt divider indicator is uh, that, that it continues to sound when the vehicle is moving even though the seat belt is buckled. You've already buckled the seat belt, it's still going ding, 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 ding. Technician A says the vehicle speed signal isn't making it to the gym module. Technician B says the seat belt buckle may need to be replaced. That can usually be fixed with a can of WD-40. This is actually Brian does. It sounds like Whatever that line, <laughs> what he does is that little you know. dinger in there, he sprays that WD-40 in there and shorts it out. So <laughs> it's, it's, All lights go off. The seat belt buckle, you just spray it inside the buckle. Well, the lights go off. It won't be going ding, ding, ding anymore. <laughs> Question 11. What most probably caused this? The teeth are knocked off that blind wheel. A, it's a forward. B, the starter was bad. C, the starter wow. wasn't properly shimmed. D, the flywheel ring gear was too soft. E, operator error, or F, cheater pack. It's messed up. It's messed up. This is where the starter bolts up right here. There's actually, uh, on these GM cars, they've got a shim between the starter and where it mounts. Oh. But the, you know, it's got that shim that's got the fork on one end, the hole here a little. And there's various different thicknesses in there. <sighs> Question 12. Which of these two posts should be connected to the alternator output terminal? That one, that one, the small one, or none of these. That's on a starter, by the way. Mm -hmm. I ought to have me a lap saber to point with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd burn a hole in the screen or Question three. This 36 volt motor fits what? A GM vehicle, a Ford vehicle, BMW? This doesn't go on a vehicle. What's wrong with this starter? I'll give you a little hint. She had to pump it to get it to, and it was a brand new starter. I mean, one that she just got. She had to pump it to start, start the vehicle every day. She was having to bump her other when she put this on there, she had to pump it too. And that was very confusing to her. I know, I know, I know. Brad? Shut up. All right. All right. WD-40. Question. 
<laughs> Question 15. Here's an intermittent starter. Now this is actually normal starter operation on this car, right? So you're not going to see a problem here, but this is what it looks like. There's your PCM feed. That's the relay that feeds the PCM with voltage to wake it up. There's your injector pulse width. There's your spark. There's your battery. This four channel recording was taken during a normal start. Now, the next one you're going to see was taken when it didn't start. Alright, no starter operation. A, the battery is weak. B, the spark is weak. C, bad injector. Or D, none of these. That was done with Wacon's flat recorder, which records those four channels. And this one here I have in the PCM feed, that'd be your auxiliary. This thing's pretty darn cool. It's kind of pricey, but it, it, it works on, you know, it helps. We're just reading live data. You got it? Question 16. The customer says that since the transmission was removed and reinstalled, the electric, electric lift gate release doesn't work on this vehicle. Technician A says the fuse must be blown. Technician B says the transmission range sensor connector may not be seated correctly. Who's right about that? Look at the schematic. Use your skills. If you can't read a schematic, you're not making it. That is an absolute epic fail on your final if you can't read a schematic. Because you will need to read a schematic to get past your five electrical finals. So you got five engine performance finals. You've got to fix five cars, each one of them in 20 minutes or less. And we got five electrical finals of various different stripes. Except McBride's taking the advanced course. He's got ten electrical. Ten cans of WD. <laughs> no, actually, seriously though, I do know the answer to 14. I've encountered that. All right, then. We'll write the answer down and we can, uh, we can share it with us in a bit. Question 17. This reading is A too low, B too high, C shows a dead battery, D shows a sulfated battery, E shows an inoperative charging system. F shows current draw. G doesn't show anything useful. H can be done left-handed. That is, by the way, with the engine running and the alternator charging. Question 18. What do these readings tell you? Now, every one of these is being referenced from the ground side of the thing. Whenever it's extremely close up like that, sometimes it's harder to recognize, but you'll be able to figure it out if you know the name of it. What causes this kind of damage? A, low voltage. B, a bad flywheel. C, an overcharging alternator. D, a bad torque converter. E, a bad ignition switch. Big smile. She knew exactly what the answer was to that one. These are the answers. 
All right. Are you gonna, can I trust you to grade your test? Yeah. Honestly? Yeah. Those characters over in Geneva, they all erase answers and put new ones. One of them was right, answering his questions real light with a pencil, just bare. <laughs> so you can really, really, really light. And I walked over there to look at it and I said, let's see. Make sure that all y'all have answered all your questions. Oh, well, I can barely see yours. Let's go ahead and mark these really solid so we can see it. I went around and marked all of his answers right away. He did like that. He's, <laughs> he's going to erase them and try to get a hundred on that. Cluster illumination is typically a series parallel circuit. Series parallel. You know what the difference between a series and a parallel circuit is, right? Parallel circuit, all of the lights have got, their, you know, any of them can blow and you still got the rest of the lights. But there's actually in series with that, there will be a, 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 a potentiometer or, well, no, it'll be a rheostat actually. Because you know the difference, right? So there's in series with that. And then that. Technician, they said that the tail lamp is blown. Now, Tim, you may have seen this before. Somebody, inevitably, is going to put a radio in a vehicle, and they're going to go with a test light looking for a ground, and they're going to find a ground right here, and they're going to put a darn ground wire up to there, and as soon as they turn everything on, they lost their park light, I mean their uh, dash lights, because they put a ground here, because they go, wow, there's a ground right there. I'll just hook it into that. So if you're reading the ground, this is both right here. And you're going to read the ground right there if that circuit's not energized. So yeah, be careful about that. Just make sure that you know what you're looking at. <coughs> Good command. All right, this is neither one of these guys. Is right. Any, here's, a, here's a red flag when you're taking a test right here. Here's a red flag. All, all, always, never. Whenever you see that, it's typically a red flag on a question. Unless you're in the Navy nuclear program and they're talking about letting the reactor melt down, you should never do that, okay? <laughs> All right. To determine the full extent of the role of a particular electronic component plays in the system, the description and operation page is the best place to go. Well, it doesn't matter whose software you're in, they're all going to have description and operations in there. They got them, they're going to tell you how the system works. Question number five, technician A says the instrument lamps are fed through a rheostat on the headlight switch. Is that true? Is it true or is it false? That's false. They're fed out of this silly microprocessor thing in the cluster. Technician B says these lamps won't work unless the trip reset button is pressed. Now you know that's going to be ground there. The trip reset button is not going to have nothing to do with you. Just think about that, you know. One time there was this Cadillac in the forward place over there, and whenever you wash the windshield, this bright light would come on and say low washer fluid. And the shop foreman came over there and he says, What do you reckon wrong with this Cadillac? With this low washer fluid? It's full of fluid. And he says, and When I check this, I get out here and relays clicking and I got all that. And I said, That washer fluid relay, I mean, that washer fluid reservoir switch is bad. He said, yeah, but how do I know that? I said, because I just told you. He went, <laughs> he got, so anyway, he told the guy that worked on it, he said, I guess just go ahead and get one of them reservoirs. I don't know what else to do, you know, because you couldn't buy the switch by itself. Later on, a guy comes and says, now, what happened with your Cadillac? He says, that reservoir fixed that light. Well, see, he was wanting to know why it wouldn't the light on all the time. I says, if you've got a Cadillac and you're low on washer fluid, do you want that thing shining in your face? Because it is really bright. You know, it's only supposed to come on when you hit the washer. That's how they had it wired up. You figure that out. It's like you can figure out that pushing the trip reset button ain't got nothing to do with the lamp, right? Anyway, I says, what did Philip say about that washer reservoir fixing it? He says, it burned him up. He didn't want it to fix it. He wanted to come back and tell me it didn't fix it. All right. Technician A says, one good way to check this BMW brake light switch is to bypass it to see if the circuit works. Is that a good way to do it? Yes or no? It is, isn't it? All right. Technician B says, checking a load carrying switch with an ohmmeter is not always a rival test because... It can have any little bit of continuity at all, even a tiny little thread of copper wire. That meter will take it real good because it ain't loading the circuit. Right? Both. Not a reliable test, not always. With the key off, if you apply the brakes on this vehicle, nothing electrical will happen. Now, can you tell me why nothing electrical will happen? Anybody can look at this and tell that. This is not it's a closed. trick question, huh? It's closed. Huh? It's, the circuit's closed. I don't understand what you're even saying. 
What is this thing? What is that thing? Hot sign of any fuse power only when the ignition is on. Only when the ignition is on. You're supposed to be able to look at this and figure it out. All right. Key off. There's no power going to that coil. If there's no power going to the coil, then you're not going to have anything working that switch. See, this right here, whenever you power it up, this has got to be connected to that by turning on the key before this will turn on that light. Now that's the kind of thing you're going to, you will see questions like this again. Don't go to sleep, McBride. All right. What's the meter set to read? No volts. No. None of the above. You should have put a D there. This is set to read. What does that symbol right there mean? What does that symbol right there mean? DC. DC volts. Right? All right, what's that symbol right there mean? AC volts. AC volts. That's AC volts. See the wave? See that one? That's DC volts. Sierra, you see that? That's DC volts. That's AC volts. What's that? What's that down there? What's that for? These meters have one, have that on them. That diode check. And then we gotta start over from scratch again and start all doing everything else. What's that? DC amps. What's that? Oh. Greek letter omega, which is ohms. All right. All right. Okay, Google girl, tell me about your answer to this one here. Uh, is it something about one has three, uh, three terminals and the other one is much beefier? What is it? <laughs> well, that's not a bad. <laughs> that's amazing. Beefier. That's what I said on every single well, that was pretty darn beefy. Well, a, re a rheostat basically pulls, carries a load. Yeah, that's. And it'll have a ceramic. Situation. It'll have a ceramic resistor so that it's, it's carrying that. <laughs> it, it, it gets hot as it dials in more resistance, and it's got to have ceramic on there. You know, like the thing on Rambo that they used to fire him up whenever they had him over there to this thing, and it was using all that stuff. Anyway, <laughs> this right here is. A potentiometer, which is like that, which only all it does is send a signal. It raises and lowers the voltage, but it's got a ground and it's, it's got three. It's got ground, it's got a reference voltage, and it's got a voltage that changes with movement. So the rheostat basically is going to change the, you know, like, like the clearest example of that will be like on the old headlight switches that had a rheostat on there for your uh, dash. So that's demo. the beefier one? The beefier one is the rheostat. <laughs> Uh, the seat belt reminder indicator continues to sound. Technician B says the seat belt buckle may need to be replaced. That's what he was talking about the WD-40. You spray that down in there. Sometimes that'll fix it. And sometimes the door is jar light on some of these Fords. <laughs> if you just spray WD-40 or something up in the door latch and open it and close it a bunch of times, it will clear that up because that's where that thing's uh, mounted on that. All right. This one right here, the starter wasn't shimmed properly. Uh, my lunch partner's father-in-law put a starter on this car and it had the thickest doggone shim I've ever seen. And he felt like, well, if that was the shim that was there before, that's the shim that needs to go back, which it never should have been on there to start with. And it just busted the teeth right off of that flywheel. And we went out and had to pull the transaxle out of that thing with a flywheel in it. And we took the shim and threw it away. Now, you are supposed to shim one. There, how many, you know, sometimes if a starter doesn't sound right, you're basically supposed to, like on a GM starter, what we used to do is this an old, you know, 70s trick. Uh, if you put a washer on the outboard bolt, it tilts the starter in a little bit and gives it, you know, the clearance on the gear is more like this. If you put a washer on the inside bolt, it brings it out. If it ain't just right, it may sound horrible and cause all kinds of issues. The Cadillac that Dr. Rydell's, that 71 Cadillac, it is, it's a GM, but it ain't got a starter bolting up like this. It's got one bolting in like this. And it was a 76 engine and a 71 model car with who knows what year model transaxle and all that. There's enough product variability in building all that stuff. That that starter was really strong, and when it would shoot that, uh, that starter drive out, it would knock a tooth off that flywheel. Just knock it slam off. And, uh, and after Bobby Lundy put that thing on, he put a flywheel in it, 
And it, it, almost immediately started doing it again. So I beveled all the teeth on that flywheel when we put the next one in there. And so, it would, they, so they'd be opposite the bevel on the starter, and it never did that again. They've been starting it for years now. I don't know why that was necessary, but we were engineering, you know. All right, where is that supposed to go? On a lot of these, that top, that main post on that starter solenoid, they use it for a junction because it works really good for that. We had one that was down at the bottom of the hill and they did some work on it. I don't know what kind of work they did, but they said the charging system wouldn't work. And they had the alternator wire hooked to there instead of there. Battery terminal there. Let's say, so like, it was easier to get to that one. That's why they hooked it to there. That's like whenever you lost your keys and you're over there in the, under the light looking for them, and the cop says, where'd you lose your keys? Is it over there under that tree in the shadows? I said, well, why are you looking out here? She says, because I can't see over there. All right, question 13. This 36 volt motor goes on a GM vehicle. You know those GM vehicles that whenever you stop, they die? And then when you, hit, put, when you give them gas, they're like a go-kart, it fires them up and they drive away? That's what that's for. 36 volt system. And then the cables will be blue going to it. I know, I know, I know. This one the here is loose. Or uh, uh, it's the screw. The screw huh? actually was not quite tight in the brown. The brushes get their ground through these screws here, and are mostly through that one apparently, because it was arcing around that screw. And I'd seen that on some of those big. Uh, Mitsubishi starters on those power stroke diesels. I'd get under the truck out there on the service lot and I'd see scorching around that screw and I'd take that screw out and brush it really good and put it back together and tighten it up and the guy, that's all it was needed to get that diesel truck going again. <laughs> I don't know how many times I did that. Or you could put a $750 starter on it, you know, whatever. All right. This one right here was on a Chrysler Crossfire we worked on. Now, the story to that was she took it to a dealer somewhere around, and they spent $2,500 trying to figure out why the car, you know, put, just throwing parts at it, trying to make it work with start. But sometimes she'd turn the key and it just wouldn't do nothing. And so what we did was this PCM feed was not waking up the engine controller, and so the engine controller would never operate the starter. And the other day, Charles had a thing in his hand over there. Um, this thing. There's a bunch of relays built into this thing. This right here is what that Chrysler Crossfire has. It's got <coughs> a whole bunch of relays in it that you can't replace just the relays and it's $450 for that little module. That's what was wrong with that car and she never had any more trouble with it after that. But it took that little recording to pinpoint that. It's pretty scary when you think this might be what's wrong. And if you put it on there and it's just like it would, think about that for a minute. All right. Customer says since the transmission is removed and installed, what do you think? Tech B. You see this? The hatch ain't going to work when you got it in drive driving down the road because you lose kids, dogs, ice chests, and all that if your hatch pops open and you hit the wrong button when you're driving down the road. So when it's in drive, if it's in anything other than neutral or park, that hatch ain't going to work. And that's on the transmission. If you don't plug that in good, you may plug it in good enough where the car will start and all this. We had one like that here one time. He came in and said, since y'all fix the oil leak on my vehicle, but that thing won't work. This right here is voltage drop on the ground side. Now, it's supposed to have more than one-tenth of a volt of voltage drop. I should have made that a bigger number. But on the positive side, you're allowed to have a half a volt. On the negative side, you're only allowed to have a tenth of a volt. That's two tenths of a volt. That's a little bit too much. Not that it would cause a terrible problem, but it does indicate a problem. What do you see here? Bad or corroded ground. See the voltage drop here? You're measuring between here and here. You're not, you haven't dropped all of your voltage and you haven't made it to the ground yet, but you've got a bad ground here. You've got a dim light. You're going to drop a little voltage through a circuit like that along the way but you shouldn't have any voltage drop right there at all. I mean, you shouldn't be measuring any voltage there at all. All right, that is the commutator on a starter where the brushes ride, and that's low voltage. Low voltage will cause that because it's like the starter's kind of locked up, 
and it's made, it's doing a job that's too big for it, it overheats it. 